Hello my goblins and ghouls, my name is Steven. If you're new here, I started an open source project around a pick and place machine which automatically assembles parts onto circuit boards, and then I started a company selling them. If you wanna start from the beginning, you can click here to catch up. So the Lumen is good, it is efficient, it is stable, and feeders are good. Eight millimeter feeders have been in people's hands for months now and they're working great. And we just finished validation of 12 millimeter feeders and we're actually gearing up for production on them as we speak. So what is left in SMT world? It's time to talk reflow. So what are we using right now? This is the Unexpected Makers Reflow Master Pro. Now, not the whole oven, just this black box on the side. This is a controller that's made by my buddy Sion, and this will control an off-the-shelf toaster oven to be a reflow oven. Now what he sells you is what's inside this 3D printed case, but you need to bring your own solid state relay, you need to bring your own toaster oven, and you have to do all the mains wiring yourself and get the whole thing plugged in. In my situation, I wanted to be able to use a Loctite GC10, that's the paste that we use here, and it needs needs 250 degrees C. So I took two and a half days and I ripped the whole oven apart and I did a bunch of mains wiring. I put all the solid state relays inside the frame. I did a bunch of insulation with RTV silicone and a bunch of fiberglass so that it could reflow following the profile curve that GC10 requires. This thing is great. It's a workhorse. It works fantastically. Now, I totally understand why Sion is selling this as it is. It's a huge liability to do anything that deals with veins, so he has you do that yourself which makes a ton of sense, and I love this thing. If you're currently in the process of looking for a reflow solution, I highly recommend you buy a toaster oven, buy the Reflow Master Pro. It's just not perfectly off the shelf, but once you get it all together, it works awesome. Feeder boards. <laughs> And then there's this thing, the T962A. If you go on Amazon or eBay and you search for a reflow oven, you'll find a million clones of this thing. And it seems like it's gonna work great for like 350 bucks or something. It seems like a great option, but it is fraught. Hackaday literally has a page about all the modifications you have to do to this thing to make it like even usable. There's paper masking tape around like the hot part of the thing inside and it will start smoking the first time you're up. It's just, it's bad. There are even projects around making whole custom new firmware images to go on this thing because the firmware that comes by default is so bad. We did all these mods to this one and it still doesn't work. There's still cold spots. We don't get consistent reflow on it. It's not Good. If you've had good luck with your mods with this thing, please let me know in the comments. I'm really curious how you managed to convince this thing into doing useful work, because we've tried everything and it just doesn't do what we want. Goodbye. So what am I gonna make? Building an entire reflow oven from scratch is an insane amount of work and a ton of money, also considering the certifications, there's a lot to it. So before I dive into that path, I wanna see if I can just take an off the shelf toaster oven with no modifications and control it well enough to have it do useful reflow. If I can build a project that's just a box that you plug any toaster oven into and you clip a thermocouple inside of it and you hit go and it's really good for reflow, it's an off the shelf solution, you don't have to worry about modifying it or anything, that's the dream. So to test that, I bought a lot of ovens. <laughs> So what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure and see how hot these things can get at peak and also the rate at which they can go. And then I'm going to compare that with the slope that's required for a bunch of different common pace. These things are two, both like 60 bucks, so they're not that expensive from Amazon in the US, but there should be comparable stuff pretty much globally. So we're just going to try and profile a couple of these things, see if it works. Should we do air fryer or normal toaster oven first? Uh, I think Normal one? Okay. I didn't feel like writing a whole like Arduino data logging thing for it, so I'm literally just going to every five seconds check the temperature on my multimeter and write it into a Google Sheet and then graph it. <laughs> and that's how we're gonna do it. And do a little slope calculation calculus in Google Sheets <laughs> to find out how performant they are. Wait, no. Oh yeah, I'll go back, go back, go back. So I know y'all are gonna roast me at how I stored all this data in Excel like this and like, fair, that's totally deserved. In general, the air fryer with the resistive heating element was way too slow. It had such a lame curve for everything and sure it might, you know, air fryer chicken wings really nice, but the convection, it doesn't matter as much. What we really need is that we need that curve and the resisting heat heating element 
just isn't fast enough. But then when we got the really tiny little toaster oven with the quartz tube, it's so much smaller, so there's less air to heat up, and it, it got to temp really fast. There were only a couple little bits that didn't quite follow the curve, and they're really just at the beginning. And that's just the initial ramp. That's not even the soak temperature. It's not even that peak where you actually get to reflow where you're over the liquidity temperature. It's just that beginning getting up to like 60 C. I think that's gonna be totally acceptable for most pace that people are using. So this idea has legs. Ideally, I could just take a toaster oven off the shelf and effectively unplug it and plug it really fast with a PID loop based on the temperature, and I could reflow boards off with an off-the-shelf toaster oven with just a magical box in between. So in case of this scenario, I made these. This is a reflow oven test bench board. I did something a little different with this controller board in that I'm not trying to make it fit the final vision of what this product's gonna look like at all. I'm just making a board to test. It's got a big old microcontroller on there. There's an SD card slot for like profile saving and data logging, a little OLED screen and a couple buttons for navigation, uh, a thermistor port so I can actually measure the temperature, and mains control. And that was a trip learning how to do that. But before anything else, I'm gonna get this thing soldered up and then we'll dive into how it works. All right, so the board works. Nothing about what I just tested was particularly new. I've talked to a lot of OLEDs and spun up a lot of microcontrollers, but it's still exciting to know that it worked fine the first try. I did also check trying to talk to an SD card. You can just talk spy to them and save data and open files and stuff. It's awesome. So all that's like pretty plain Jane, nothing new, but this main stuff is the weird thing. So what's going on up here? Here's mains power. So how do I make this less so that I can control the reflow oven really precisely and only turn it on a little bit to, to follow the temperature, to be able to put a PID loop behind it. I can chop this wave up and kind of like PWM mains a little bit. Now, if I just PWM it randomly and just turn it on and off and I'm not doing it in sync with this wave, I really don't know how much power is gonna come out of it. These two filled in sections have the same width that could be triggered from a PWM signal, but obviously they're putting out different amounts of power based on where I've caught the wave in its period. So instead, we can actually watch this wave and wait until we see these points right here, which are called the zero crossing points. This is when the voltage differential between the two lines in mains equals zero. It's going from positive to negative. So let's say we can detect these points. First of all, cool, that's pretty sick. Whenever we get one of these, we know we're about to get a wave. 
And now because we're watching where we are in the period of the sine wave, we can just wait X amount of time, turn on the wave until we hit to the next zero crossing point, and then we have really fine control about actually how much of this wave are we sending into our system. So in order to get this, we need two things. The first thing that we need is a way to detect this zero crossing point. And the second thing is a way to turn on mains until we hit the next zero crossing point. So for the first one, we could just use a full bridge rectifier, make this wave be more like that. And then when the voltage gets really, really close to zero, we have a trigger a signal. And there's a schematic that is very commonly used for the zero crossing detection thing. So that's exactly what I implemented. And then the other half of this is actually toggling the power. There's a really nifty component called a triac, which does pretty much exactly this. You can give it a quick signal on the gate and it will allow current to flow through either direction of the other two leads on it until it doesn't see current flow anymore and then it stops conducting. Isn't that sick? I'm gonna bring my brightness down because the sun came out. So what I can do is wait for that signal from the zero crossing point, wait in a certain amount of time, and then send a pulse to my triac. And then that will turn it on, it will give us power through the triac and power our load, and then it will automatically turn off when the wave hits zero because no current is flowing. And then we just repeat it all over again for the next one. Wait a certain amount of time, hit the pulse to the triac, and wait for the next zero crossing point. So that's what I did. Here's the triac setup too. This is how I did the whole triac thing. And all that stuff lives up here in this mains area up top. And these two components that connect, one of them is sending the zero crossing signal back to my microcontroller. And then the other one is sending the signal to trigger the triac. So that's how all this stuff works. It's time to actually put a little bit of firmware on this thing, plug it into mains, and see if I can control a toaster oven. <laughs> I should really learn After Effects. I made this little base unit to hold the board and actually hold some plugs in the backside. So here's a standard US electrical outlet. And this is what my toaster oven's gonna plug into. So this pops in the back just like that. And then on this side, I have an IEC connector. Haha. -ha. So this is where my power comes in and then my switched load goes out through this back to the toaster oven. And I just made this little base just to give myself like a platform to test on so I don't have to hold the board that has mains on it. I'm trying to be as careful as I can about all this. And then this accepts all the cables through the terminal block on the bottom and should all mount together real nice. Okay, it is time to just test it now. The board takes firmware, I can get the screen to work, and like, I know it works. I have all the main stuff wired up, I just need to plug it in and make sure that it doesn't pop. Everything that I've done for research of figuring out how this stuff works says it should be totally fine, but mains is no joke. <laughs> it can kill you, so I am wearing my glasses and I'm getting ready for it to sizzle. So I'm just gonna plug this in to my electrical outlet here, and I have a, a switch I can just turn it off really quickly if need be. <laughs> All right, three, two, one. Okay, everything seems okay. I see no sizzle. Great, okay. At least it doesn't fry the microcontroller, that's huge. I have some firmware on here that should just be checking on an interrupt pin every time we see that zero crossing period happen on mains, and it should just count up and display it on the screen. Here, let me get you scoochy in here so you can see a little better. So you can see it says zero there, that's the number on there right now. Okay, here we go in three, two, one. <laughs> Holy smokes, look how cool that is. So that should be 120 counts per second. That is so freaking sick. Okay, so I just put new firmware on it that instead now it should send a pulse out to the triac after a certain delay. So we should get like a 50% duty cycle and the oven is plugged into the back. Three, two, one. Oh, it's on. And it's buzzing, it's like making a, well it's not anymore. I thought it was making a PWM sound. Everything looks good on the board. That's working. Oh, I'm getting a little smoke. Yeah, that's definitely driving it. Oh yeah, that is smoking. Okay, I think it was the component. I think it was actually the triac that was starting to get smoky. Well, it kind of works. It works for like 10 seconds. <laughs> 
Okay, so I'm pretty sure that the problem I'm facing is not that anything is wired incorrectly, it's just that the triag is getting really hot. The like steady state current that this toaster oven pulls is 10 amps and in general, the triac has to put out about one watt per amp that it's putting through. So that means 10 watts of heat is coming off of this thing. And the one that I'm using is only rated for about two watts in open air. So I'm at like one fifth the cooling that this part needs. That's why it's getting smoky. It is working, it is chopping the current and it's sending it out, but only for a while. So I think I just need a lot better thermals on my PCB and I need to add like a huge heat sink to the thing. Okay, after even a little more reading, I think I should just change my approach. So the triac does that cutting in the middle of the phase, but after asking around a little bit, I'm worried about that with EMC and like it just may not ever pass EMC testing. And instead to use a zero crossing solid state relay, which is wherever you trigger it on, no matter where you are in the phase, it will always just come on on the next zero crossing period, which means it's really, really good for EMC stuff. And you don't have quite the same amount of control over when mains is on or off. You're not chopping up each individual arc of the wave, but you are able to select whether each half wave is on or off. And you can kind of PWM like two out of every three arcs are on and you can do stuff like that. And the reason I'm even thinking about switching is because solid state relays I think are going to be a lot better for handling this crazy amount of current. These triacs are really just meant to turn on like an incandescent light bulb I think. It's really meant for that kind of thing, not a whole oven. So if I get something a little bit more beefy that is kind of more of like a, a finished object off the shelf, granted they're like 35 to 40 bucks each, but if it solves the problem and works a little better, I don't have to worry about thermals as much and it's going to be better for EMC. I think that's a better approach, but I'm not sure. If you have thoughts about how I should be going about triggering kind of like an analog value out to a 10 amp, 120 or 240 volt source of a toaster oven, please let me know in the comments. All right, folks, that's it for this one. In the next one, I'm gonna come full circle with the Lumen, the thing that kicked off the whole project three and a half years ago. We're getting back into it. I'm gonna make some glow ties. I need a one-to-one -one comparison. The whole reason I started this thing was to make glow ties. I wanna see how much easier it is. And then after that, we'll keep getting into reflow oven stuff. Even though I didn't actually, like, wasn't able to reflow a board with this test bench, I've learned a ton from this. But anyway, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.